Well, hi, everyone. This is for Pentecost 2023. And most of us think of Pentecost for two main reasons, although I've come to believe many other things about Pentecost. If you look at my sermon that's posted, uh, the five-fold meaning of Pentecost, it goes into what I'm talking about. But today I want to talk about the Holy Spirit. That was the primary understanding of Pentecost from Acts 2, is God immersed his children into the Holy Spirit. In the Old Covenant, it was on Pentecost when God spoke, thundered his law, the Ten Commandments and his law at Mount Sinai. Those are the two main things that people know about Pentecost. Now, I posted and reposted, hang on just a minute, I posted and reposted uh, other audio sermons, like I said, you might want to look up the one on, on Ruth and Boaz if you don't know the connection to Pentecost. You might want to look, on the, look up the one about the one body, and it's a very important topic for us to look at, as well as there, there's one on 22 things that the Holy Spirit does for us. Well, I'm Philip Shields. Welcome to Light on the Rock. It's God is the rock, and Jesus Christ is the light. Jesus is the rock, really, as well, and he is our light. Please feel free to invite people to this website. You don't need my permission or, any, or anything like that. We literally have several hundred videos up now and several hundred blogs of short articles. Anyway, I'd like to talk to you more about Pentecost itself today, but my main topic is going to be just what is the Holy Spirit. But before we do, let me just remind you a couple things about the Pentecost. Pentecost means 50th. I used to always think it meant count 50. It's 50th, from the 50th day from the wave sheaf offering, and, um, which was, and it's counted from the weekly Sabbath, not the annual Sabbath like the Jews do. So they always end up on Sivan 6. You wonder why you have to count if it's always a fixed date. But anyway, it was on this Pentecost when the early believers experienced the Holy Spirit. We get baptized and have the hands laid on us and we're wet and all of that, but we don't experience a big roaring tornado, you know, practically. Wind, loud noise, fire over our heads, speaking in tongues, other languages. It's the most unusual day. So they knew about the Holy Spirit. They experienced it. They saw its consequences. And I want to try to make Holy Spirit more real to us. We hear the term Holy Spirit so often that I don't think it means as much to us today as it should. But this was the day when God immersed, baptized, immersed his children into his very own divine nature, into his own power, into his own presence. Pentecost marks the end of the barley harvest and the beginning of the wheat harvest. And so it's called the Feast of First Fruits. And that's what you and I are in James 1.18, we are a kind of first fruits. Paul talked about a lot of his people that he that helped him early on in his ministry as the first fruits in Achaia, the first fruits in Rome, or whatever it was. Pentecost continued to be kept by the early church. In Acts 20, verse 16, Paul wanted to be in Jerusalem, if, if at all possible, for Pentecost. 1 Corinthians 16:8, I will stay in, Ep in Ephesus until Pentecost. So another thing about Pentecost is that we do collect a Holy Day offering on this day. It's a Feast of Weeks, Feast of Sabbath, Deuteronomy 16. It's all in my notes, too. I hope you'll print out the notes. And those of you who print out notes, I hope you'll listen to the audio as well. There's a lot of things I say that I see are not in my notes. So anyway, it was also on Pentecost when God married or got betrothed to uh, Israel and Ruth and Boaz were married about this time. Remember, they were sleeping on the, near the pile of barley. So the barley harvest was ending. They were getting ready for the wheat harvest. And um, it was also on this day when God would give his guarantee of the Holy Spirit. And the Greek word for guarantee is arabon. And it's interesting that in, in Israel, I'm sorry, in, uh, in, in Athens, if you were to buy an engagement ring, <clears throat> The word for Holy Spirit being a guarantee is arabon. It's arabona for an engagement ring because that's a commitment to finish what you started. It's a commitment to marry. And you'll see the connection if you look at my sermons 
on uh, the wedding of the Lamb. I have three-part sermon on the wedding of the Lamb. You'll be amazed if you haven't heard it. When is it? Where is it? Who's going to be in it? And who won't be in it? I think you'll be amazed. Uh, the wedding of the Lamb. Look it up in the search bar. Today, I want to focus now on the Holy Spirit of God. And when I ask the... Um, when I ask people to define what is the Holy Spirit, if you're talking to somebody who knew nothing about it and just said, well, what is it? You would say the Holy Spirit is, and people often stumble and stop, and well, I don't know what I would say, frankly, Philip. Or some say it's the power of God. Some just come right out, it's the power of God. And others say it's the third person of the Trinity. And, um, and there's often a lot of hesitation. Well, I've spent many hours, my wife and I have, studying and restudying it. I think many, many people don't really understand the Holy Spirit. I know I will grow in understanding. One of the things the Holy Spirit does is it leads us and guides us into all truth. Anyway, just before Acts 2, just before the coming of the Holy Spirit in Acts 2, Yeshua the Messiah, Jesus the Messiah, told his disciples in Acts 1, 4, and 5, don't go anywhere. I want you to stay put in Jerusalem because there's something coming. Uh, he commanded them to stay and wait for the promise of the Father. You shall be immersed. That's what baptized means. It doesn't mean sprinkled. It's, you shall be immersed with the Holy Spirit. In just a few more days, you'll see the scriptures on the board behind you. And you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. Verse 8, Acts 1, verse 8. You shall receive power. Now, they were just a few people, and he was going to tell them, you go to all the world, preach the gospel to every nation. And they were going to need power and confidence and energy to do that. And he tells them, you're going to have power when the Holy Spirit comes, and you'll be witnesses to me to all the whole world, starting in Judea. So why do we need this topic? Well, you're going to find that there's so much said in the Bible about the Holy Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, that we certainly don't understand much of the Bible correctly if we don't understand the Holy Spirit. We're told the Holy Spirit's coming inside of God's children. You certainly want to know what you're putting inside of you or God's putting inside of you, don't you? But just imagine it. God is in you. God chose you to give you a piece of Him. God selected you, chose you. I think we, we lose our excitement. Uh, I have a sermon, I forget the exact title, I'll try to put it in the notes here, uh, about how exciting our first fruits calling. Um, I'll make a note here and put it in my notes, a, a link to that, that sermon. I, you you got to hear it. Uh, our, our first fruits calling is, should be very, very exciting to us. And so anyway, uh, we want to talk about this, we want to learn about Holy Spirit, so we understand how God is working with us. If you were asked to define the Holy Spirit, most professing Christians who've done any study in the Bible or with their church or whatever, their understanding is the Trinity. I, I'm not one of those. Okay, I want to make that clear. Because you'll see why. Most professing Christians claim that the Holy Spirit is the third person. The first one is God the Father. The second one is God the Son, Jesus. And the third one is the Holy Spirit, unnamed spirit. It just has no name. Three persons who are not each other, this is part of the definition of Trinity, three persons or personalities that are not each other, but also are co-equal. They're equal to each other, but they're not each other. Father is not the Son, is not the Holy Spirit, but together all three of them become one God. And that is the best definition I could tell you about the Trinity. Don't ask me to explain it. It's hard to find a theologian who will explain it. Billy Graham, I heard him, I was just flicking channels, there he was, and he says, I can't tell you what the Holy, I mean, what the Trinity is. I just know it's real. It's the best definition of God. And we've got to believe it. That's what he kind of said that. But the early believers never believed it. They never discussed Trinity. The word's not even in the Bible. It wasn't an issue. And then at the Council of Nicaea in 325 AD, Constantine thought getting the things about God all all united and everyone saying the same thing would sure help. But the main discussions at the Council of Nicaea wasn't, 
they weren't even about the Holy Spirit. It was about the, the nature of God and the nature of Jesus Christ. Was Jesus God? And that was a big fight, a big discussion. The Holy Spirit never really came up much in the Council of Nicaea. It wasn't until about 50 to 75 years later that, I think it was Athanasius, Athanasius, a bishop of Alexandria, of Egypt, of all places, who kind of fine-tuned the teaching on what we now know as the Nicene Creed and the Holy Spirit and all of that. Uh, it didn't happen, though, until the late 300s, almost 300 years, 250 years at least, from the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ before there was any real discussion about the Holy Spirit. And so if, it, if the Trinity is real, certainly Peter and Paul and Jude and James and John and Jesus would have been talking about the Trinity, but he doesn't and they don't. Anyway, the second uh, thing you should know, if you're asked to define Holy Spirit, I mean, many of you don't profess the Trinity, but you would say that the you just say casually and simply, the Holy Spirit is the power of God. That's what Jesus said they would receive, right? In Acts 1, verse 5 and 8, you will receive power uh, from the promise of the Father. And uh, you'll receive the Holy Spirit, the power. And yes, many, many other verses do support that it has power, is power of God. Uh, but it's not, what I'm saying today is it's not limited to power of God. So we miss some of it if we limit ourselves to just that. The difficulty we have is that we're flesh and blood trying to explain spirit. I've never been a spirit being. Neither have you. It would be like finding a blind man and tell him you have an audience of 10 other blind people, blind from birth, all of you. You haven't seen a thing since birth. And you pick on somebody to explain to them all what the color blue is. And I want all the shades explained. Blue, light blue, sky blue, cobalt blue, thalo blue, all of the different colors. Aquamarine, navy blue. He's never seen blue. How's he going to explain it? I would find it hard to explain blue to blind people myself. I really would. How would you do that? So we know that God is spirit, John 4, 24. We know that, and that he is holy. Angels are called ministering spirits in Hebrews 1. And there are demons and fallen angels who are called evil spirits. And I'll give the scriptures all in the notes, and we'll hang them up here. On, in fact, you should be seeing them on the screen. And there is something called spirit in man as well that we all have, and that's what gives us a mind. Scientists and evolutionists still haven't discovered this. It's spirit. But this is why we can uh, make music, and this is why we have artistic qualities, and we can talk, and we can reason, we can figure math, and we can build jet engines because we have something that makes us different from the animal world, and it's when God breathed into Adam. And ever since then, we've had that spirit in man that goes back to God when we die. Ecclesiastes 12, 7 says the Holy Spirit, I mean, not the Holy Spirit, the Spirit in man, when we die, goes back to God who gave it, and also Ecclesiastes 3, 21. Ecclesiastes 12, 7, if that's what I didn't say, that's what I should have said. Ecclesiastes 12, 7 and 3, 21. Every human has it, and, but it's what makes us human. But the Spirit in man is not Holy Spirit. I mention that because I've seen some people who say that we have the Holy Spirit, the Spirit in man, and they quote the verses, but it's not. And God's Spirit, in fact, couples with our spirit in man that makes us the children of God when that happens. Romans 8, verses 14 to 16, we'll read now. <clears throat> For as many of you as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God, or children of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, you receive the spirit of adoption. It, the correct word is adoption. Some of you think sonship. No, it's adoption in the Greek. You receive the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. My favorite word for God most high is Abba. Abba, Daddy, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And it goes on to say we're heirs of God in verse 17. 
Let's move now to Galatians 4, verses 6 and 7. Maybe we can keep both of these up at the same time. Galatians 4, verse 6 and 7. And because you are sons or children, God has sent forth the Spirit of His Son into your hearts, crying out, Abba, Father. Therefore you are no longer slaves, but children, and if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. But nowhere are we told, by the way, that the Spirit in man is eternal. We all know life can come only from God, the Father, and Jesus Christ through Him. God alone has inherent, in Jesus, have inherent immortality, and He alone, God alone, can give spirit qualities to others like angels, demons, and others. Okay? And um, God has always pre-existed. Jesus has too, and will continue to exist. Who alone has immortality? I'm putting scripture up now. 1 Timothy 6.16 God who alone has immortality, um, unless he gives that immortality to his children later on, as we know in Revelation 20, we don't have any second death coming to us. And um, keep in mind, though, okay, that God is spirit and God is holy. And so he is holy spirit. Did you hear that? God is holy spirit. But Ephesians 4.4 4 says there's only one Spirit. One Spirit. One Holy Spirit. Ephesians 2.18 says all have access to Father by the one Spirit. Be sure you also read 1 Corinthians 12, verses 4 to 11. I don't have time to read all that now. But I'd like you to read 1 Corinthians 12, verses 4 to 11. How the Holy Spirit gives, we're given different gifts of the Spirit. And it's all the same spirit, even though we're getting different gifts. Some people can organize. Some people are real good with um, uh, healing and miracles and speaking and prophesying. Those are gifts. And someone else has the gift of faith, extra gift of faith. I hope we all have some faith. It's the same spirit, we're told. Now, one thing I want to clarify before we go too much further is please, all of you, in the King James Version, it doesn't say Holy Spirit. Those of you reading out of the King James, you'll be reading Holy Ghost. Please, it's not ghost. That is such a bad translation of that word, that phrase. I know some of you think the King James is practically as good as the original Greek. Those of you who believe you can preach only from the King James, this is a bad example of, a good example of a bad translation of that phrase. My father, who was a missionary and preacher, Protestant preacher, always preached about the Holy Ghost, and the Holy Ghost on fire when I was young. And to a small boy of five, six, or seven years old, I didn't like hearing about a ghost. Terrified me. Till one day he heard me acting really strange, not being able to go to sleep, and he said, what's the matter? What's the matter? I said, I'm afraid of the ghost. I said, what ghost? I said, you talk about it all the time, the Holy Ghost. So, um, Anyway, explain it. No, it meant spirit. I said, well, why don't you say spirit then? I was probably six or so. Because ghost is scary, Dad. Anyway, the Greek word for spirit is pneuma, P-N-E-U-M-A, where we get wind and air and breath and spirit. Might have something to do with pneumatic tires or whatever. It, in the Greek, it's a male, masculine gender word. But in the Hebrew, the equivalent word ruach is a feminine word. So go figure. You can't, you can't base he or she or it on that. So go figure. Both can be translated breath, wind, or spirit. And the only place where a Greek, in the Greek, where the word ghost is used is not, is not about the Holy Spirit, which is the pneuma, the wind, the breath, and all that. It is in Matthew 14, 26, when uh, Jesus told the disciples, you guys go on ahead. I've got to pray first and do other things, and I'll catch up with you on the other side. And there was a storm, and it was hard going, and they were still in the middle of, of the Sea of Galilee, the lake. And all of a sudden, probably at 2 or 3 in the morning, they saw what appeared to them a ghost. Now that word in the Greek is phantasma, where we get phantom, or specter, ghost, okay? And then this ghost that was walking to the boat 
<laughs> they, they thought it was a ghost. It was Jesus. And he says, cheer up. It's okay. It's just me. It's just me. So please, I hope if you say, or if you are saying Holy Ghost, I hope you look it up yourself and you'll see that that is better used as Holy Spirit. It's just about all the other translations have it that way as Holy Spirit. Now, some quick points. I want to just quickly go over some things on the Trinity. So you know I don't teach it. you got to know why I don't. And these are some quick points that might help you discuss it if you have to discuss it with somebody ever. First of all, the Trinity was never taught in the first 300 years. The first almost 400 years. The word Trinity is nowhere in the Bible. Paul and Peter and James and John never even mention it. The concept was unknown. Point number two, the Holy Spirit gets snubbed a lot if it's a co-equal person among three that are one God somehow. Whenever Paul, let's, let's use Paul, Jude also applies, Peter applies. When they begin their books, their epistles, Paul says something very similar like, from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord is most of the time after Acts 9, almost always referring to Jesus Christ, the Lord Jesus especially, and does not include the Holy Spirit in all those greetings. That would be quite a snub. If I was the third person, hey, greetings from Father and Son, and don't mention the third one, why is that? I think that's not a good, it's not a good thing for someone who wants to believe that it's an equal to the Father and the Son. I mean, even when Jesus says, where was that? Uh, John 10, 28, I think. It might not be right. But anyway, but where he says, the Father and I are one. He doesn't say the Father and the Holy Spirit and I are one. No, the Holy Spirit gets snubbed a lot. Now, the other point three now, <clears throat> there are verses that the Trinitarians say, look, this proves the Trinity right here. If you don't go anywhere else. Just go to Matthew 28, 19. You shall make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name, singular, of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Boy, that does sound like Trinity, doesn't it? The problem is the phrase that begins with the word baptizing, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I will put in my notes a link where you can see lots and lots of authority sources saying those words were added. They were not in the original. The original was more make disciples in my name. Jesus speaking. In my name. Because when you're baptized of all things, are you baptized in, in, in the Father? Are you baptized in the Holy Spirit? You're baptized into the body of Christ. Romans 6.3 if you want to look at it. Romans 6.3-6. It talks you were buried with him in baptism, buried with him, with Christ. It's a death, a picture of a death of the, of the old nature. <clears throat> so anyway, uh, that verse is not there. The other one that they like to use, you know what I, okay. The other one that they, they like to use is... Um, 1 John 5, verse 7. Only the King James, in this case, and New King James, have 1 John 5, verse 7 and 8, with all these extra words that just about all the scholars out there now admit this shouldn't be there. It's not in the original manuscripts. So all the other newer translations, except King James and New King James, I think New King James puts a puts a note that this shouldn't be there, but they still print it out. And so I will, I will put in my notes uh, verses 7 and 8, 1 John 5, 7 and 8, and I'll put a cross-out line across the words that were added later on. Okay, There are three that bear witness in heaven. This is the original. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit, and these three are one. Boy, that sounds like Trinity. Those words weren't there. In heaven, to the word one. And then the next few words aren't there either. And there are three that bear witness on earth. That wasn't there either. That was all added by some 
copiers who wanted to have something more to say about the Trinity. So there are two main verses they use or would like to use. First John 5, 7, 8, and, and uh, what was the other one? Um, Matthew 28, 19. Matthew 28, 19. The words weren't even there. Okay, so that's the third point. The fourth point, co-equal. There is no way, if you know your Bible, that even Jesus, the Son of God, would ever say he was equal to the Father. He's equal in the sense of being the same kind. Because there is that verse in Philippians 2 that being equal with the Father, that meant being like the Father. That he would be willing to come down as a mere man. But other than that, there are so many verses where we're told, Jesus speaking, the Father is greater than I. I do what the Father says and tells me to say and do what, I, what he tells me to do. I go where he tells me to go. I am the one sent. He's the sender. He's greater than I. The one sending is greater than the one sent. And over and over and over and over. And 1 Corinthians 11, 12, the head of Christ. I'm sorry, 11, 3. 1 Corinthians 11, 3. The head of Christ is God. And when he has finished reigning on the earth for a thousand years, and all the enemies and adversaries of God are put down, it says in 1 Corinthians 15, 28, that he himself, Christ himself, will be subject to the Father. So that's the fourth point. There's no way that even Jesus and God are co-equal. They're not. Point number five, God is building a family, but the Trinity really limits it to just that triune Godhead. But look at Ephesians 3, verses 14 and 15. God wants a family. 1 John 3, 1, in fact, says, Now are we the children of God. God is going to have a family that are like him in his family. That should be so exciting. We don't, we don't like to preach it because other people will deny that. But that is one of the most exciting doctrines you can have. Anyway, Ephesians 3, verses 14 and 15. For this reason, I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. Okay, so those are the reasons why I cannot subscribe to the false teaching of the doctrine of the Trinity. I don't care how many people believe it. I don't care that traditional Christianity will not consider someone a real believer if they don't accept the Trinity. Well, it's wrong. It's just plain wrong. Now, anyway, something else to understand as we go through this. One thing they all do show verses, though, that treat the Holy Spirit as a person. And frankly, for years, that has bothered me that we would say in our, the church where I was growing up, we would just call it it or the power of God. And, not, and yet there were these verses that gave it personality, it gave it personhood. And I'll show you those as we go through. But before that, I want you to understand that the Holy Spirit was given in the Old Covenant, in the Old Testament as well, to individuals here and there. Individuals. Daniel was said to have the Holy Spirit. Joseph was said to have the Holy Spirit. Moses um, and uh, Gideon, Caleb, Joshua, Samson. In Samson's case, it seemed like, I'm not sure that Samson always was strong at any given moment. There's so many verses that say, and when the Spirit of God came upon him, he did this or did that. So maybe he just looked like an ordinary person, but when God's Spirit came upon him, or it may be that he was strong all the time. I don't know. I suspect he looked just like me and you and all the, all the other guys, okay? I don't think he looked like Mr. Universe. But then starting in Acts 2, God immerses his children with power and divine nature. Another definition of the Holy Spirit. In the New Covenant, a precondition to receiving the Holy Spirit was repentance. Remember, Peter said, repent, be baptized, receive the Holy Spirit, Acts 2.38. The only exception that I can see about baptism before you receive the Holy Spirit was Cornelius' family. Um, God wanted to make a point that, no, hey, listen, I'm calling Gentiles now too. They're going to be equal with Jews. As far as their opportunity to be called. 
But other than that, it's also an acknowledgement that you accept Jesus as your Savior, confessing that he died for you, and that his blood cleans you up, and then God resurrected him from the dead, that you have to confess, Romans 10, verses 8 to 13, you confess the Lord Jesus died for you and was raised by his Father, and you believe that. This is the same word for Gentiles equally here. So without that prior acknowledgement of who Jesus was, who Christ was, Christ means anointed, Messiah means anointed. Messiah comes from the Hebrew, Christ, from, Christ comes from the Greek. Prior acknowledgement that Christ, the Word of God, unless you acknowledge him as the Messiah, the Book of God, the Bible, the Tanakh, the Torah, all of that will remain closed to you, and you won't see what it really is pointing, who it's really pointing to, which is the Son of God. He is the Word, remember. I like to say he's, he is the Word rather than to say he's the Torah. He's the Word. So we acknowledge Yeshua, Jesus, as God's anointed Son before scriptures will open up for us. I hope any of you of the Jewish faith are reading and understanding. Much of the Old Covenant Certainly, certainly the New Covenant, of what's being said points to the Savior. Until, until people accept Yeshua, they are, as the promised anointed one, there's a veil, a covering over their eyes. They don't get what they're reading. They just don't get it. <clears throat> Excuse me. Remember the Ethiopian eunuch in Acts 8? He was reading Isaiah 53, which is all about the sacrifice of Yeshua, Jesus. And the Spirit told Philip to go speak to the eunuch, get in his chariot, and ask him what he's reading and explain it. And he explained, oh, you're reading about Yeshua. He came. He's the Messiah. The Holy Spirit helped the eunuch understand, or God did, even in this case, even before he received the Holy Spirit. But he did acknowledge he did acknowledge Jesus. That's what I'm saying here. We have to acknowledge Jesus to have the veil taken away. Then he got baptized. Now, 1 Corinthians 2, verse 9 to 12. I hasn't seen, nor ear heard, nor has entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. I hear a lot of people quote that, by the way, and they don't quote the next verse. So in the sermons on that verse, I've just read. Therefore, we can't understand the things of God. The next verse, but God has revealed them to us through his Spirit. I'm really happy when people continue reading. For the Spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. If we have God in us, then God is saying this is what it means. This is just what it's saying here. What man knows the things of a man except the Spirit of man, which is in him? Even so, no one knows the things of God except the Spirit of God. So the Spirit of man helps me be human, have a mind, and understand human things. But I can talk about algebra to a cow, and it would just look at me, right? Because it doesn't have that understanding. Verse 12, But now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God. So God sends that Spirit. Let's jump to 2 Corinthians 3, 14-18. Their minds were blinded, talking about the Jews, reading the Torah and the Bible. For until this day, that same veil remains unlifted in their reading of the Old Covenant or Old Testament because the veil is taken away in Christ. If they don't acknowledge and accept and see Christ, they won't see Scripture. And so much of it, like Isaiah 52 and 53, point to him. But even to this day when Moses is read, a veil lies on their heart. Nevertheless, when one turns to the Lord, the Lord is Jesus, remember, one Lord Jesus, the veil is taken away. In the New Testament, the Lord is Jesus. In the Old Testament, the Lord can mean God the Father or it can mean the Word. So I'll explain some other time. Now the Lord is the Spirit. 2 Corinthians 3.17. I don't recall having that verse emphasized and read often where I grew up in the church. The Lord is the Spirit. 
Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 3.17. And where the, Lord, the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all with an unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory. So when I look in a mirror, he's saying this time, instead of seeing myself, I will be seeing Yeshua, seeing Christ. And as I focus on that, I will be transformed. Too many of us focus on our negative things. We should be focusing on Him. So remember 2 Corinthians 2.17, the Lord is the Spirit. I'm going to show you today that in the New Testament, the Holy Spirit is primarily the means that God uses to reveal Himself, to open up our minds, to give us power, to give us answers we need, to guide us, to lead us. The Holy Spirit does so many things. I've got that posted sermon, 22 things the Holy Spirit does for us. You need to look at that. Through Christ, especially, is what God's doing. God is Spirit. And so this is Himself. This is His Spirit. We'll see the Holy Spirit is the manifestation of God and mostly of Jesus Christ. And, and, and when they appear, when God appears directly in front of us, it will say God said or God appeared and God did. But if it's done by an extension of God, His Holy Spirit extended to us, in us, then it talks about the Holy Spirit. It's still God, though. It's not an it. It's not something else other than God. It's still God. And that, that's what confused me as a teenager growing up. Because that wasn't made clear to me that way. So remember, Jesus, who is the Lord, is the Spirit. We just read it, 2 Corinthians 3.17. In the New Testament, the words, the Lord, especially after Acts 9, calling of Saul, who became Paul by name, Who are you, Lord? I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. This was on the road to Damascus. You can look it up in Acts 9. From Acts 9 onwards, almost every time the word the Lord is, sometimes it's even combined with the Lord Jesus, or the Lord Jesus Christ, or the Lord Christ, or just the Lord. It's referring to Christ. Okay? Remember we're told there is one God, one Father, one God the Father, and one Lord, and one Spirit. Let's read it, Ephesians 4, verses 4 to 6. There's one body, one spirit, one Holy Spirit, one spirit. Just as you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord. Other verses say that's Christ. One faith, one baptism, one God, and Father of all. I know sometimes people in the New Testament will change the word the Lord to Yahweh or Yehovah or something, it's a different word. It's, it's the Lord, the one Lord here is Jesus. And the one God here is Father, who is above all. There goes your co-equal thing, right? See, they're co-equal. I can't accept Trinity because it's, it's a lie. They're not co-equal. Philippians 2.11, And every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And 1 Corinthians 8, 6, For there is one God, the Father, of whom are all things, and one Lord, Jesus Christ. And so on. Why is the Holy Spirit not mentioned here in 1 Corinthians 8, 6? It's not. Holy Spirit is God's very being. It's His presence. Holy Spirit is God's divine power. Holy Spirit is God's divine nature. Holy Spirit is God's presence. You're going to see all that as we go through the sermon. Let's look at 2 Peter 1, verses 2 to 4. 2 Peter 1, 2 to 4. When we understand that Holy Spirit is God's very presence, plus His divine nature, plus His power, all combining together and coming inside of us, we should be saying a great big wow. Wow! Why me, Father, that you would let me have all that? But I think we take the Holy Spirit for granted. Certainly not the third person God Trinity thing. Second Peter 1 verses 2 to 4. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord as his divine power 
has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. With that power, we have the power to overcome. We have the power to be different. But we don't utilize it. I don't. I don't. I don't utilize it as I should. I'm trying to change that. And uh, verse 4, by which we've been given ex great and exceeding precious promises that through those or through these you may be partakers of the divine nature. That should be exciting. The Holy Spirit imparts to us God's very divine nature, who he is, what he's like, having escaped the corruption that's in the world through lust. So now we're starting to de describe and define God's spirit. It's about God and Christ. God's very presence, his divine nature backed up by his divine power. So nature is what? God is love. That's his divine nature, love. Holy Spirit is love. Frankly, all the listed fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering and kindness and goodness and all of them, right? I don't think I got that, all of them yet. But anyway, it, it's, the, it's, it's God. It's His nature. God is love. God is joy. God is peace. God is long-suffering. Okay, God is all of these things. God is kind. When we receive the Holy Spirit, we're immersed into that very nature if we'd only focus on him and ask him to come inside of us. We must get excited about this and ask God to activate that Holy Spirit that understand also that out of the billions in the world today, somehow God picked you, God picked me, and a few others. Very few. I don't know if there'd be a million. Very few. Maybe, I don't know how many. As long as a person has God's Spirit, that person is a child of God, no matter where they are, where they live, or where they attend. If they have God's Spirit and are led by God's Spirit, Romans 8, 9, and 14 says they are children of God. So I hope we get excited about that, that God has chosen you to be the dwelling place of himself, of his nature, of his presence, of his power. It's come into you. Holy Spirit is what makes overcoming possible. Holy Spirit makes us able to harness the power of God himself, his righteousness, so we can fight sin. Okay? We're saved by grace through faith. But verse 10 in Ephesians uh, goes on to say, you're saved by grace through faith. But verse 10 says, and uh, verse 8 and 9 says what I just said, but verse 10 says that, let me just put this in my notes here. Verse 10 says, called for, called to do the good works that God called you to do. So we're supposed to still be doing good works. We're saved by his grace, though. If you're grasping all this, you should be feeling pretty excited now that you know that very God himself is living inside of you. John 14, 23 says, uh, if you keep my word, then my Father and I will come and make our home in you. John 14, 23. My Father and I, this is all of the Holy Spirit. But don't forget, we still have that bad carnal nature. We still have the bad carnal heart as well, the deceitful heart. But we have also a new heart now from God that is not deceitful. So now if someone asks you, what's your heart like? You'll say, well, it depends which heart you're talking about. If you're talking about the new heart God's given me, it's wonderful. It loves God. It wants to obey God. It's kind. It's sweet. It's, it's joyful. It's, it's loving. If you're talking about my normal, carnal, physical heart, oh, that can be pretty deceitful and ugly. We have two hearts. They fight each other. Now, some people ask, well, is this the Spirit of God or the Spirit of Christ that we have? Romans 8, 9. Remember, Ephesians 4, 4 says we have, there's one Spirit. Romans 8, 9, look at this. If you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit... If indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is not his. In that one verse, explains, it doesn't matter if you want to call it Spirit of Christ, God's Spirit, Holy Spirit, Spirit of God, it's all one Spirit. I hope that's really clear. Now I want to mention also the Holy Spirit 
is more than just the power of God. Even Jesus had other words like comforter and helper to describe Holy Spirit. Power certainly is biblical. We receive power upon ordination. Timothy, Paul reminded Timothy, you've been, when I laid my hands on you, you received power and not the spirit of fear, but dynamos, power. Okay? The Holy Spirit was what begat Christ into Mary. And uh, Luke one thirty five, she says, how will I have a child? I've never known a man. And the angel, I think it was Gabriel, says, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the highest will overshadow you. But he will be called Son of God, not Son of the Spirit, Son of God. The words power of God are also used for the gospel. Romans 1.17 is called the gospel, the power of God. The cross, the cross is the power of God for those who are perishing. And Christ himself is called the power of God. Not just the Holy Spirit, but Christ himself. The Spirit, of course, is called the power of God, power of the highest. So anyway, um, let's receive that Holy Spirit and start putting it to work. Because it says in Luke 12, verses 43 to 45, that God will bless the servant that he finds so doing, so doing when he returns. He's busy working, busy doing the work of God. So I hope you, uh, those of you who would think that you want to define the Holy Spirit as the power of God, will start to, especially as I finish this, in the next uh, half hour or so, that, maybe not that long, but as you start to see what the Bible says about this Holy Spirit, so much more than just the power of God. When I was a teenager, 55 some years ago, growing up in the church that I was growing up in, I don't think that's the only church, the only true church. I've learned that. Whoever has God's Spirit and is led by God's Spirit is a child of God no matter where they attend. Romans 8 9 and 14 tells us that. Even Yeshua said, I have sheep not of this flock, and I shall bring them, and there shall be one flock. Okay? But anyway, when I was a teenager, I found it hard to explain why they kept saying it, referring where the Bible might say he or him, they would say it. And we always talked about the power of the Holy Spirit and, and, and limiting it to that. And yet there were all these verses, some of which I'll talk to you about today, that gives it personality. Certainly the Trinitarians use those. But they, they, uh, they ascribe all of that to a third person. But I've come to see Holy Spirit as God himself. Holy Spirit is a person. The person of God. The person of Jesus. God can appear to us as Christ, if he wishes, as he did to Abraham and when he sat down and had lunch with him in Genesis 18. It says, why HVH, Jehovah, appeared suddenly. Abraham has lunch with him. But no one has seen God. But he also appeared to, he also appeared to Samuel. I think that's in 1 Samuel 2, around verse 10 or so. I'll put the exact verse in there. Either way, it's God himself. God's a real person. Okay, God's a real person. A real being with lots of personality. So I don't accept the Trinity concept at all, but saying the Holy Spirit is the manifestation of God. It's his presence, his power, his divine nature, his glory. And that's spread throughout all the universe. Where can I go from your spirit, O God? Where can I go? If I go here or there, it's, it, it, your spirit's there. Your presence is there, it says. We'll see that again in a minute. And that being is God himself explains all these scriptures I'm about to read that shows a person, a being, is being referenced in terms of the Holy Spirit. It's God's very presence, essence, nature, power. This is why the Holy Spirit is shown to us with personality, like a person, because God is a personality. God has that personhood. The Spirit is Christ. The Spirit is God. The Lord is the Spirit. Remember we read that. 2 Corinthians 3.17 
I believe many times in the Old Testament when we're told, then the word of the Lord came to me and said, that might have even been the literal word of God, might have been Jesus appearing to them back then. I can't say for sure, but it makes sense to me. So therefore, going forward in many cases where the Bible says he or him, I'm not going to be changing it to it because he refers to God. God is not an it. God is not an it. So if the Holy Spirit refers to God, we have to say he or him or whom. So don't be reticent to use the word he. Now, let's start in Acts 5, verse 1. These verses that ascribe things that apply to people, apply to persons. Acts 5, verse 1. Certain man named Ananias and Sapphira, his wife, sold a possession. He wanted to make it look like he was so generous he was going to give it all to the church. He didn't have to, but that's what he was trying to give them. He was going to try, it was like lying. And he kept back part of the proceeds, his wife also being aware of it, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit. Notice that. And you keep part of the price of the land for yourself while you, while you had it. Was it not your own after you sold it? Was it not your own to control? But why have you conceived this thing to lie? You haven't lied to men, but to it. It's not what it says. You have not lied to men, but to the power. It doesn't say that. He said, you lied to the Holy Spirit. Then in verse 5, you lied, verse 4, I mean, you lied to God. Here you see Holy Spirit and God being put in the same equation. We can only lie to a person. If you can lie to the Holy Spirit and by doing so be lying to God, then to me, I have no problem with saying the Holy Spirit is a person. The Holy Spirit is the person of God. That's going to be hard for a lot of you to accept because you've always been taught it was it. And a power, some of you. Based on our old understanding, that might be difficult. But let's keep going. I want to read again 2 Corinthians 3.17. The Lord is the Spirit. The Lord is Spirit. You can flip that around. The Spirit, therefore, is the Lord. But we weren't being taught that. But that's so true. That's right there in the Bible. The Lord is not merely a power or an it. The Lord is the Spirit. The Spirit is not merely a power or an it. Spirit is the Lord. Grieving the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 4.30, do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God. You can't grieve a power, like a bulldozer or something. You can't grieve a power. You can't grieve an it. You can grieve a person. Don't grieve the Holy Spirit of God, in whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. So when we grieve the Holy Spirit, we're actually grieving God. There's several verses. Psalm 95, verse 10. I won't have time to read it, but you can look it up. Psalm 95, verse 10. Psalm 78, verse 40. How often they provoked him in the wilderness and grieved him. Context is God. So don't grieve the Holy Spirit is identical to saying don't grieve God. Now, I want to start showing some things about the Holy Spirit that really apply more to Jesus. Who gives you life eternal? Christ or the Holy Spirit? Or is there a contradiction if I said both? Or is it Jesus through the Holy Spirit, his Holy Spirit? I've already shown you that Jesus is the Holy Spirit. He is the Spirit. John 6, 63, it's the Spirit who gives life. Who gives life? The flesh profits nothing. 
The words that I speak to you are spirit and they are life. Who is life? John 14, 6, Yeshua, Jesus says, I am the truth, the way, and the life. You search the scriptures. John 5, 39. You search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. But these testify of me. Remember, he'd said that if you don't acknowledge him, you won't understand the scriptures. John 5, 40. But you're not willing to come to me so that you can have life. So who gives us life? The Holy Spirit or Christ? It's both. Because both are the same one. The Lord is the Spirit. The Spirit is the Lord. It's the Spirit who gives life. I am the life. John 14, 6. John 5, 40. You're not willing to come to me that, I, that you may have life. John 6, 27. Don't labor for food that disappears. Labor for everlasting life, which the Son of Man will give you. John 6, 27. And there are others as well that point out that it's Jesus. God has given him the authority that once he starts working with us to lead us to repentance and to give us eternal life through his Spirit. Remember the Holy Spirit is called the nature of God. It's also another place in Peter called the seed of God. The seed then comes into us, gives us new life, Unless we're born again, we won't see the kingdom of God. John 3, verses whatever it is, 6 or so. Maybe John 3, 3. You have to be born again. The Holy Spirit also spoke to individuals. Power doesn't speak. It doesn't speak. Holy Spirit speaks. I just read you one where the Spirit told Philip, get in the chariot and talk to him. The Ethiopian eunuch, John 8. In Acts 10, Paul, uh, Peter has this incredible vision of this sheet coming down full of unclean animals. And God says, rise and eat. And Peter's shocked. I've never eaten anything unclean or common. Later on, he says, God showed me not to call any man common or unclean. God wasn't saying you can eat crab and all these bugs they're trying to get us to eat now and so on. No, no, no. Kid you not. They're even looking at cockroaches prepared a certain way. Ugh. Lobster, shrimp. The garbage collectors of the ocean and the rivers. Acts 10, 19, while Peter thought about the vision, the Spirit said to him, very clear language, behold, three men are seeking you. Very clear words. Have you ever had that happen to you? Very clear words. I don't mean urges, nudges. Very clear words. And that then led to the story of Cornelius' family. Acts 13, 1 to 3. <clears throat> Here, the Holy Spirit speaks to the group of five or so prophets who were fasting and praying and seeking God's direction. Verse 2, Acts 13, 2. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, Holy Spirit said, Separate Barnabas and Saul, that was Paul, for the work I've called him to very clear language that all five of them apparently heard. Paul was forbidden to go to parts of Asia, Acts 16, by the Holy Spirit. Now, I have had experiences too. When you hear a voice, whose voice is that supposed to be? The Holy Spirit's voice the Lord is the Spirit, remember. In John 10, 27, Jesus said, John 10, 27, My sheep hear my voice. My sheep hear my voice. And I know them, and they follow me. There are times that I've had very specific words put in my head. Several times, I remember one that I'll tell you about. I was having breakfast, and I just had this very clear, 
instruction. Call Jim right now or David, whatever his name was back then, going back like 50 years. And not that long, 40 years or so. Call him. And I remember having this spoonful of Cheerios. I put it down. Carol says, what's going on? I said, I don't know. I was told to call Jim. And when I did, he was sobbing on the other end. And he was saying, oh, I was just praying that you would call me. He was an alcoholic. I got drunk last night, and I robbed a Safeway. It's like a Publix or a food store, Kroger. I robbed a Safeway with a water gun. I spent the night in jail. I'm sure God will have nothing to do with me now. Certainly won't hear my prayers. So what are you talking about? God told me to call you. That's happened several times, very clear language like that. Other times it's a strong urge, a strong nudging. I don't get them all the time, but I get enough to know it's from God. I remember one time being told to go downstairs, turn on your email. It was two in the morning. I turned off my computer. I kept going back to my bedroom. This time it was very loud in my head. Check your email. Just like that. I don't have time to go into the story. But I was calling somebody in Europe had the same feeling, God's not hearing me anymore. I said, are you kidding? I told her the story. Anyway, how about the fruit of the Spirit? Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, right? Kindness, goodness, faithfulness, all of them. Is it the fruit of a power? Is it the fruit of an it? Or is it, it, or is it the fruit of God? The Lord is the Spirit. Aren't we told in John 15, abide in me and you will bear much fruit? If you don't abide in me, you won't bear anything. But you abide in me because you're in me, you will bear much fruit. And then in Philippians 1.11, we're told to bear the fruit of righteousness, which is by Jesus Christ. Philippians 1.11. So which one's bearing fruit, Holy Spirit or Jesus? It's the same. The Holy Spirit is Jesus. The Holy Spirit is God. The Holy Spirit is the Lord. The Lord is the Spirit. But that's not what I was taught. So I hope you will pray about this and understand it's, it should be very exciting. Jesus also spoke about John 14, verses 16 to 18, that he's going to send the Comforter, the Helper, the Parakletos. Parakletos means someone who comes alongside to comfort you. I just didn't have this in my note, but let me just jot it down. 2 Corinthians 1, I think it's verse 3 and 4. This again is God telling me to, hey, you should have this in there. It's not in my notes. 2 Corinthians 1, I think it's around 3 and 4. He says, when you go through all these painful things you're going through, God will comfort you so that you can comfort others we're going through similar pain. Go back and read it. God will comfort you. So who's the comforter? The Holy Spirit or God? This is God the Father. The Lord is the Spirit. My Father and I are one. John 14, verse 16 to 18. I'll pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever. The Spirit of truth. Who is truth? John 14, 6 again, right? He's the way that, the, the, anyway, he's the, the way, the truth, and the life, right? The life, the way, the truth, all, whatever the order is. Whom the Lord cannot receive, but he dwells with you and will be in you. Jesus was dwelling with them. Jesus was going to be in them. The Lord is the Spirit. John 14, 23, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father and I will love him. And we will come to him and make our home with him. So it talks about the Spirit coming and dwelling in you. It's the same as Father and Jesus dwelling in us. First John 4, verses 12 to 16 says, If we um, 
God, if we love one another, God abides in us. In verse 13, by this we know that we abide in him. I've got to give a sermon again on being in him. We just don't hear about it. Being in him. It's not that just he's in us. We're in him. And he in us. I had a minister say we can't be in God the Father because we're so full of sin still. So I thought my sins were washed away. I thought there's now no condemnation to those who are in Christ, Romans 8, 1. And if I'm in Christ, he is now my life. So I died. My life is hidden in Christ in God. Colossians 3, 3 says that. My life is hidden in Christ, in God. So the way I can be in God the Father is by being in Christ who is perfect, sinless, completely clean. Boy, I have so many scriptures here. The Holy Spirit will guide you into all truth. I'll send him to you. The helper, if I don't go away, the helper won't come. I'll put them in the notes. i got to keep moving. God is everywhere by His Spirit. Psalm 139, verses 1 to 5. You know everything about me. You know my lying down, my getting up, he says. Psalm 139, David does. Verse 7, where can I go from your spirit? Trinitarians love this, to show a third person that is everywhere. Where can I go from your spirit? Look at the next sentence. Where can I flee from your presence? The Holy Spirit is God's presence. It's not a third person. It's God's presence. Verse 8, if I ascend to heaven, you are there. The same God that I began the chapter with, who knows my rising up and going down and everything. If I make my bed in the grave, you are there. And every translation I check says, your presence. Remember again, the Lord is the Spirit. Where can I go from your Spirit? The Lord is Christ. The Lord is God. Doesn't the Holy Spirit guarantee our salvation? We know that, right? Ephesians 1, 13, the last part of it, and 14, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. But who guarantees it? Is it really an it or a power? No, it's not the power. It, it, it's, it's God. Philippians 1, 6, being confident of this very thing, that he who's begun a good work in you will complete it. The one who began a good work in us is God the Father calling us, giving us to Jesus Christ. It's not just a power. Are you seeing it? I could go on. I, I cut out about 15 pages, by the way. Holy Spirit is God. Holy Spirit is Christ. Christ is Holy Spirit. The Lord is the Spirit. So when we speak of Holy Spirit helping us overcome, for example, isn't that really letting Christ be our life and come inside of us? Galatians 2.20, I no longer live. I was crucified with Christ. I no longer live. The life I live, I live by the life, by, by the life of Christ and faith in that because he loved me and gave himself for me. It's a paraphrase of Galatians 2.20. But Colossians 3.3 3 and 4, if for you died, your life is hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is our life, appears, then you'll appear with him in glory. So when it comes to overcoming, understand that Jesus said, I've overcome the world. So make overcoming very personal with Jesus Christ. As you do your constant contact program, if you don't know what I mean, look it up in my search bar. Constant contact. I now say several times a day, various things, different things. But for example, I might say, Lord, don't stand outside my door, knocking on my door. Come on in. The door's ajar. I want you in my life. I'm opening my door. Come in, Master. Come into my life, my Lord. Sit with me. Let's eat together. Let me eat with you. Teach me. Correct me. Change me. Put your nature in me. Teach me your word. Give me your righteousness, Father's righteousness. Impute it to me, like you said, 
the gift of God's righteousness, Romans 5, 17. The church I grew up in didn't preach imputed righteousness. But all of Romans 4, certainly Romans 4, verses 20 to 25, and Romans 5 talks about the gift of God's righteousness, the gift of God we don't talk about. So I ask him to be my life, my king. I repent of stepping away from you. Transform my mind to be clean and good and righteous, to be you. And you have none of the world in you. You have nothing from Satan in you. You never sinned. Please transform me to be more like you. I'll give you a couple of verses that go with that. i got to keep moving. So the Holy Spirit is the person of Jesus Christ or God, who is a person, but not a third person, okay? Um, about the temple of the Holy Spirit, 1 Corinthians 6, 19. Is that really what it's all about, the temple of the Holy Spirit? Yes, it is, because the Holy Spirit is God. 1 Corinthians 6, 19. Do you not know your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God? And you're not your own. So God sends out his spirit, extension of him into us. We now receive the seed of God and the nature of God, the glory of God. Amazing, the presence of God. We do all to the glory of God, right? 2 Corinthians 6 Verses 16 to 18 says, And what agreement does the temple of God, we would heard in 1 Corinthians 6, that it's the temple of the Holy Spirit. Now we're hearing that this Holy Spirit is the temple of God. Holy Spirit, God, same thing. Person, personality, God. The Lord is the Spirit. The Spirit is is the Lord. For you are the temple of the living God. 2 Corinthians 6, 16 to 18. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God. They shall be my people. Therefore, come out from among them. Be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean. In this case, the Lord means God the Father. Do not touch what is unclean and I will receive you. I will be a father to you, and you will be my children, my sons, my daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Here we have again the temple of the Holy Spirit, the temple of God Almighty. Same thing. One Lord, one God, one Spirit. I hope this is helping. I want to end it at this point and go back and review it. It might be new material for a lot of you, or a lot of you may already have known this. I was asked at the feast last year, just what is the Holy Spirit? And I said, well, it's the presence of God with his divine nature and his power, and his, it is God. The Lord is the Spirit. And the guy almost clapped. We were having a small meeting. He almost clapped, and he said, I rarely hear that said that way. Thank you so much, sir. Anyway, he understood it. So I know some of you understand this. I hope all of you will. The Spirit is God. The Holy Spirit is his nature, his power, his presence, coming in his seed, coming inside of us. So I'll submit this now. And, 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 and uh, I feel if you study and review all the scriptures, you will see it. May God bless you all to see who he is, who the Holy Spirit is. Father in heaven, thank you so much that on the day of Pentecost in Acts 2, you just immersed so many people in your Holy Spirit and 3,000 more, all on the same day. May we be immersed and anointed with your Holy Spirit. Let it be like an anointing on us for your work that you have given us to do. Let us be faithful to you and seek you. Let us not be going to the spirit of the world. The spirit that's in us is greater than the spirit in the world. So we should be very careful what we're putting into our minds from the world, what we listen to and what we watch 
where we go. Father, I repent of the times I've done that, where I wasn't watching that like I should have. Everyone hearing this, I pray you'll put on their mind by your spirit right now that they will seek you constantly throughout the day and not the things of the world. Social media, our cell phones, smartphones, or dumb phones. Help us, Father, to watch what we're putting into our head. Please clean us up. We thank you. We praise you. We love you. We love you, Jesus. We love you, Jesus. What a great husband you will be to your bride. A great savior you are. A perfect son. And you're not ashamed to call me and all those listening brothers and sisters. In the book of Hebrews, he's not ashamed to call us his brothers. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. We turn now this over to you, and we ask you to guide, protect, and lead us. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Visit the Light on the Rock website, where you can view additional videos, over 600 sermons and blogs as a scriptural study reference for those who desire to have a closer relationship with God the Father and His Son Jesus Christ and learn more about His incredible plan for all mankind. We are not a church, but a nonprofit organization providing in-depth biblical studies free for all who would like to visit our site. The Light on the Rock Foundation also supports an orphanage in Kenya, providing financial resources to support their living costs and education. We never ask for money. However, any donations are greatly appreciated and will be used to support the Kenyan Orphanage and our site. Thank you for visiting, and if you find the site beneficial to you and your family, please share with others.